Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm introducing today the types of organic compounds. Last time in our previous video, we covered basic chemistry and the structure of atoms. Now we're going to talk about how some of these atoms can be joined together to form the molecules that sustain life. Organic compounds are molecules that are in a uh, uh, classification that contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sometimes nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur. These are all elements that are found in the macromolecules known as organic compounds. Uh, monomers are the small individual pieces of a particular uh, repeating compound called a polymer. So you can connect them together in series or in branching groups to make a large molecule of repeating units known as a polymer. Each macromolecule will have a carbon skeleton in organic compounds. They can be straight chained, they can be branched as I was uh, discussing just a moment ago, or they can form rings. Common rings include things like carbohydrates and sugars. The carbon skeleton has a functional group. Uh, there are lots of different types of functional groups. Some of these you should be more familiar with than others. Uh, the PO4 group or phosphate group, the NH2 or amino group is very important. Uh, also the COOH or carboxyl group, sometimes called a carboxyl acid group. And then you have the OH group, which is found as an alcohol in a C with a double bond to an oxygen. That's what we see here. When you see an equal sign, it's not an equal sign. It's actually a double bond. That's a uh, sugar bond. Here's an example of what carbohydrates are made up like. All right, so monosaccharides are single. The prefix mono means one. The root saccharide is referring to sugars. Their functional use is for energy storage and they are used for structure. Uh, there, we'll discuss the, the, the structural uses in a moment, but monosaccharides are the simplest sugars. They have this chemical formula. Six carbons, that's C6, 12 hydrogens, H12, and six oxygens, O6. So C6H12O6 are the simplest sugars. They have a ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen of one to two to one. Here are some types of complex carbohydrates. So these are polymers. And because it's a specific type of polymer, we call these a polysaccharide because they're made up of many saccharides. Glycogen is uh, found in animals and it's used for energy storage. Starch is found in plants. It's used for energy storage in plants. So like a potato in plants is a starchy plant storage. Glycogen is stored in our livers when we eat a lot of sugar. Our our bodies will take the extra sugars out and store as glycogen in our liver. Then you have cellulose, which is uh, plant cell walls. That's a structural type of uh, complex carbohydrate. And then you have chitin. And chitin is a uh, bug exoskeleton. It is also made up of sugars, which is why eating insects is a good source of energy for uh, wild animals. Okay, so now let's talk about a second group of, of complex organic compounds. These are also macromolecules. Uh, lipids are formed from three fatty acids and a glycerol. Uh, this includes compounds like fats, oils, and waxes. They don't dissolve in water because they don't have uh, ionic bonds and they don't, they're not polar. So they don't have a positive and negative side, so they don't dissolve well. 
three fatty acids and a glycerol is a really important memory that you're going to need to get into your notes and commit uh, because uh, they're so important in the structure of cells. Lipids are the primary structure of cell membranes in what is known as a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so we got to break that term down a little bit. It's a lipid that has phosphorus, all right, and it is a bilayer, meaning two layers. We're going to see the structure of that bilayer soon. Lipids are also used for energy storage. Uh, they're used for protection, uh, trauma, and heat loss are uh, two ways that lipids or fats can protect us. Uh, they can also be used as signaling molecules to, uh, to tell different parts of your body what to do. Here's the structure of a lipid. It is made by a chemical reaction called dehydration synthesis, which all of these are made by doing. All right, so this chemical reaction we'll study in a little more detail, but it is the removal, dehydration is removal of water, and synthesis is making a larger molecule. So you can remove an H2O from in between here, and the molecules will join together. Each of them wants to form a bond when you take that water away, and so because they're both right there next to each other, they will bond to each other. This long carbon chain is a fatty acid, and it's called a fatty acid because here on the end, there is a C double bonded to an O bonded to an OH. This is that carboxyl acid group we refer to as a COOH. CO OH, all right? That is a carboxyl acid group, which is why this is known as a fatty acid. It's the acid group at the end that makes the difference. Though there are three of these fatty acids that connect right to this glycerol that's gonna behave like a bracket. The glycerol has three OHs at the ends here, uh, and each one of those will combine to form a water that's removed and a new bond to hold it together. And uh, that makes a lipid. A lipid is made up of three fatty acids and one glycerol. There are different types of fats and oils, and those different types of fats and oils are determined by the molecular structure, the molecule uh, in the way it's formed. Fats are solid at room temperature, and they all tend to have single bonds between these carbons. The single bonds between these carbons make them known as what are called saturated fats. Oils, which are liquid at room temperature, happen to have more carbon to carbon double bonds or triple bonds. They are called unsaturated fats. And whenever you put double bonds in here, you have to remove some of these hydrogens. And that's why they call them unsaturated because they're not filled with hydrogen. Now, previously we mentioned phospholipids uh, in the cell membrane structure a phospholipid bilayer. Here is your uh, glycerol backbone, but instead of having three fatty acids and a glycerol, you have two fatty acids, and then you have this phosphate group. That's what makes this a phospholipid. And this phospholipid is actually very interesting because the phosphate is polar, which means as I mentioned earlier, a polar molecule can dissolve in water, but fatty molecules are nonpolar, so they don't dissolve in water. So one end is what we call hydrophilic, meaning it likes water, and the other grouping is hydrophobic, 
meaning it does not like water or it won't mix with water. So these are similar to oil, except that the fatty acid uh, that was normally at the top here is replaced by a phosphate group. And then we're going to put a whole bunch of these together to make a cell membrane. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to quickly draw uh, an example of this on our ELMO. Just so you know uh, what the structure is that I'm kind of talking about. So a cell membrane is typically drawn uh, like this. You've got a whole bunch of these, uh, what are the phosphate groups, which are not hydrophobic, they're hydrophilic, meaning they like water. And these are found on the outside because the watery membranes, all right, that uh, house our cells or make the structure of our cells will each have two lipid tails pointing in towards the middle, all right, because the lipids are hydrophobic and they want to be away from the water. And then the phosphates, because they like water and will uh, interact with the water well, they'll be on the outside. And then embedded in this membrane will be a whole bunch of protein structures and other complex carbohydrate structures and receptors and protein channels that are all found in the cell membrane, but this membrane will wrap all the way around a whole cell. All right, so it'll go, it'll form a double layer around a cell. Inside will be the nucleus. Inside will be the cytoplasm and the water and all the stuff going on inside that cell. But this cell membrane, this is a magnified version of what we see along the edge, wraps around the whole thing. Okay, so let's move on to our second type of uh, organic com or excuse me, our third type of organic compound, which is proteins. Uh, proteins are catalysts. This is an important term. A catalyst is a, uh, a material that speeds up a chemical reaction but is not changed in the chemical reaction. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So the enzymes that allow us to digest food or make chemical reactions happen are catalysts. They catalyze a chemical reaction, helping them happen faster and with less energy. Uh, and that way, we're able to do the chemical reactions in our bodies fast enough to keep us alive. Uh, proteins are responsible for transporting materials. They're important for our structure, like collagen is a, a protein that is the most common connective tissue in the, in the body. It makes up our bones and our muscles. It, uh, it holds our, our skin tissues together. It's important, uh, proteins can be used for energy storage, but they can also help to regulate cell processes like our hormones do. The structure of a protein, because it is a, uh, a large macromolecule, it's made up of repeating units, just like large carbohydrates are made up of repeating sugars, just like lipids are made up of uh, three fatty acids and a glycerol. Proteins are made up of the monomer amino acids. Amino acids can be linked together in a long chain to make all the different proteins our body needs. The functional group amino acid has parts as well, though. I mentioned this earlier. An amino group is an NH2, a carboxyl group. That's the carboxyl acid. That should look familiar. The C double bonded to an O bonded to an OH, that's the CO, 
OH group, that's carboxyl group, and then you have this R group, which is a variable group. That variable group can be one of over 60 different essential groups, but there are 20 that we need to be able to make our proteins in a human body. Amino acids can be combined by dehydration synthesis. That should also look familiar because uh, it's the same chemical reaction that puts sugars together. It is the same chemical reaction that puts lipids together. And a peptide bond, in this case, is a carbon to nitrogen bond that will allow the amino acids to link together. A polypeptide is a long chain of amino acids forming a protein. It's usually between 100 and 300 amino acids long, and the protein is composed of one or more of these polypeptide chains. The smallest protein in our human body is insulin. It is only 51 amino acids long. So this is what a peptide bond looks like. You are removing H2O again, so you're taking two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O, take the water out, and that carbon wants to bond and that nitrogen wants to bond. So they will bond to each other with the help of some catalyst. That forms a peptide bond. Now, proteins are super important because of their shape. Uh, the shape of a protein determines its function. So the primary structure is the chain order. What amino acid comes first, second, third? And then the secondary structure, it takes a three-dimensional type of shape. A tertiary structure folds that spiral and the quaternary or fourth level of our structure is when you can join more than one. And our next picture is going to do a great job of showing how that works. Protein shape determines its function. So again, looking at the shape, they are very complex. The primary structure is the order. The secondary structure is how that long chain can fold. Third or tertiary structure is the folded folds. And then the quaternary structure is where you have a yellow chain and a blue chain, two different uh, amino acid chains combining together to make a finished protein. So this is an example of quaternary structure uh, as a diagram. And then there would be an active site like this space right here where this protein can bind with something and interact to make something happen. Which brings us to enzymes. Enzymes are special organic catalysts that uh, operate in a capacity that we call the lock and key model. All right, enzymes are proteins that speed up reactions, they're catalysts, they lower the amount of energy needed to make a reaction happen, they are reaction specific, and enzymes names reflect what enzyme reaction that it's catalyzing. So often the name will tell you what it's helping happen. They're affected by pH. If you put enzymes into acid or base, they can denature. And that's an important term. Denature means to take away the nature of the enzyme. And we just mentioned that enzymes are shape specific. So you take away its shape, you're going to take away its ability to do its job. Temperature can affect the way enzymes work. By raising temperature, you can make enzymes work faster, but heat them up too much and you will cook them, literally. All right, that's what happens when you cook a piece of meat. All right, it may start out red, but as you cook it, it turns darker. It's the proteins denaturing and you're, and you're cooking or denaturing those proteins as you heat it up. Proteins within cells can be turned on and off as well uh, by certain genes. Um, we can also affect enzyme activity by the amount of enzyme or substrate that is available. 
So the reactants in this enzyme reaction is called a substrate. That's what it's working on. Sub means below. So it is below the enzyme. The enzyme is in charge and the substrate is being operated on. Each enzyme provides a site where the substrate can react and that location is called the active site. This is a, a, a diagram that shows the enzyme substrate complex or what we refer to as the lock and key model. So you have an enzyme that is reflected as this red uh, blob and the red blob has an active site where substrates can fit. They're shape specific so glucose and some other substrate here will lock into the space, it'll bind, and then those materials will be converted into an end product. It'll be slightly changed from where you started to what you end up with. Some chemical reactions are very complex and they require multiple enzymes to get a whole job done. So one enzyme doesn't necessarily do the whole job. Sometimes you need more than one. All right, this last and final, this is the fourth and final type of organic compound. And these are the nucleic acids. And I'm gonna breeze through these because we're gonna spend much more time on their structure and function later. These are the DNA and RNA subtypes. The nucleic acids are our genetic material. So there are two kinds. There's a ribonucleotide and there's a deoxyribose nucleotide. Uh, each, part, each nucleotide is made up of three parts, a five carbon sugar, which is one of these oses. If any molecule ends in an ose, it's a carbohydrate or sugar. So cellulose, glucose, galactose, maltose, these are all examples of sugars, but only ribose and deoxyribose are found in genetic material. There's a phosphate group, which we talked about earlier. So phosphorus is important to organic compounds. And then there's a base that, uh, not like an acid or base, but a base meaning like a foundation that contains nitrogen. So I'm going to show you what this uh, looks like. These are the two sugars, and you'll notice the only difference between deoxyribose and ribose is that deoxyribose has an H and ribose has an OH here. Otherwise, the molecules are identical. It's very uh, subtle in the difference between the two. So DNA is our genetic material, RNA is responsible for carrying messages from the DNA and it's directing the manufacturing of other proteins. So we will talk about the structure of these two organic compounds in much greater detail uh, when we get to genetics, but you should actually be familiar with, uh, or at least slightly familiar with the structure of DNA because it is a double helix and I can actually, I, I have a neat little um, model here that I can share with you just because one of my former students made this for me. It is a 3D uh, printed version of a DNA molecule. So it is a double helix. It's two strands that are twisted around each other like a ladder. And that's important because DNA is able to reproduce or copy itself, making new versions. RNA is a disposable, uh, useful copy. All right, so I've gone on long enough. There's lots more to talk about, but I will put our specific chemical reactions into a short video reviewing the use of the uh, dehydration synthesis chemical reaction and the uh, hydrolysis chemical reactions in a separate video just so we can re review them all together. Wishing you the best. Take care and we'll talk again soon. Bye.